Next, I would like to invite on stage Edward Kibardin, who is the head of data science at MITI PLC, and who will talk about deep learning and top topological data analysis for advanced data segmentations and predictions. Let's welcome him, welcome him more sta on stage. Um, today I'll share um, uh, with you the system I was uh, building for last uh, three or four years and uh, successfully used in a number of uh, companies. Uh, so the idea behind the whole thing is uh, currently we are drowning in a lot of data in a lot of uh, labeled and unstructured, unlabeled uh, and unstructured data. So the way how to analyze it, to structure it, to cluster it, is um, uh, un unusually in this age. So what we need to do, we need to go and try to find the ways how to uh, uh, conceptualize uh, this data. So let me uh, start with uh, unstructured data. So again, unstructured data can uh, have a lot of of different uh, types and, uh, and clusters. Well, for instance, it can be a stock market transaction, tax, medical, and DNA profiling. It can be uh, basically a lot of different types, including um, images and sound. Uh, today, I will focus on this three, customer activities, tax, and sensor signal processing. Um, this usually, also all these uh, types of data provides uh, a lot of uh, volume. And the complexity of analyzing it, usually not uh, simple. So it's uh, not as simple, especially uh, with uh, IoT with a, a large volume of the data. Um, so in the beginning, so again, unlabeled data, uh, as well as structured data. What is this, uh, in, what it can bring you? What can uh, you grab from this? So it's, for instance, uh, how many will ask, ask, um, answer questions on how many categories do you have? Or for instance, uh, which of them are better for your business, which are not? Can you put a context on co contextualize uh, the particular clusters or data set you are, you're working with? Uh, a lot of such questions will bring you uh, to uh, next level of analytics, something you can really uh, do using simple Tableau uh, uh, BI systems or, uh, or Power BI systems. So we can start with text analysis. And text analysis, especially um, in terms of, uh, for instance, current uh, approach for text analysis, a legacy approach would be is uh, getting a text file with uh, uh, words, characters, whatever, and start uh, finding out the keywords which are related to the particular uh, question you try to uh, get from this. Uh, maybe you can find some correlation between the keywords, and based on this keywords analysis, you will be able to find something interesting in your data. But it this approach will allow you to analyze basically a very limited number of documents and you asking questions. It's not the data giving you uh, any, re any results you haven't asked before. So that's why um, the, uh, the very simple problem is, for instance, what if you don't have just one or 10 such uh, articles on documents? What if you have uh, 300,000 of such? Can you understand what is this? So here is uh, the case study with Mighty. Um, so what we did, uh, first of all, what Mighty is, if nobody, uh, anyone doesn't know. So Mighty is a um, facility management company, very large facility management company, which covers uh, a lot of large clients uh, around UK and outside UK. Um, and. Um, the project we did uh, is uh, we took one of, one of the clients, uh, which has about 365,000 of maintenance job over the last two years. So that's a lot of uh, work, a lot of stuff uh, engineers did capture and did um, cover. Um, 
And what we did, uh, we analyzed what uh, the people are writing in the descriptions uh, of the particular job. So what's wrong with the, um, with the facilities? What should be repaired? Whatever stuff should be done. So the, the main aim for this is to be able to identify uh, have we actually missed any job types we haven't known before, or actually to see um, a holistic view of the data and jobs we have uh, right now. Not in a BI way, so how we can put the graphs. We, of course, we can put the number of jobs or jobs by category. But for instance, usually categorization in uh, a lot of businesses is not correct. So there might be people on the uh, sitting in the call center, which will put categories on different jobs, and they usually do it incorrectly. So you can't really rely on this. So you basically should extract categories yourself from the data. And what we've, that's the result we've done. So this is uh, the structure of uh, the texts we analyzed for these 360 jobs. So every point here is at least one comment. Uh, well, one uh, job description or several job descriptions, and colors are uh, types. So I just showed uh, 10 of them, but there are much more, um, basically about 100. Um, after some analysis, we found um, a number of distinct clusters. Well, it's actually pretty small, so I'll try to read it for you. So for instance, um, cluster here is the waste management. So the, everything related to waste, uh, waste, garbage, and other stuff. And that's an interesting small addition to Waste Manager is waste bags required, uh, which is a separate language and separate type of a cluster because it's not really waste uh, stuff. So it's not to remove waste from facility. That's more like a stock question, which actually is very good um, a very good candidate for a separate type of job because uh, it involves different skills and different types of um, managing inside the company. Um, another thing, for instance, heating and ventilation over there. Um, so branch light uh, issues, general light issues. And uh, our favorite is the loo uh, issues. So all the loo related stuff. It's actually not that small. Um, so, for instance, these are lights, loose, so there's a ceiling light, uh, bulb flicker um, types of stuff. So, how they are segmented here. So, uh, every point, they're positioned according to the unique language inside uh, the cluster and inside the job description. <clears throat> uh, means the proximity uh, descri uh, described by the similarity of language. Uh, and in this case, uh, the clusterization is very interesting. Clusterization is based on the similarity of on smaller level, on different words and keywords, but also on higher level. So for instance, um, uh, for instance, this bag uh, waste, uh, the, uh, w uh, waste bags requires that re relatively close to the general waste cluster, while it's not part of it. There are some other clusters related to this. For instance, um, some of them, like for instance, this, I don't, I don't remember exactly, but this is catering, for instance. Catering generates a lot of waste, which requires a lot of waste bags. Um, but the most interesting, actually, part here, and it's our favorite, is again, loose, but not just loose. It's lighting in the loose, so this particular cluster. We can zoom in. So, this is a unique intermediate cluster which was identified automatically by the system where two large clusters do overlap. So these are lights issues and they're loose issues. And if uh, we go and see actual parts, uh, the keywords, and the keywords are generated as well as the visualization automatically uh, from the system, we actually can review this. So yeah, gents, ladies, all the good stuff. Um, and it actually was a very good uh, case, uh, use case for the uh, starting investigation. What's happening? Because look at the uh, volume of the loo lights uh, uh, issues according to the all lights issues in the whole facility. So usually, loo is significantly smaller uh, space 
where uh, you wouldn't expect too much of problems, but in comparison, it's like almost a quarter uh, of the all lights, well, which might be one, just 1% 1 of the whole space. So there are a lot of uh, ideas what it may be, and we did a lot of investigation and definitely created a new, uh, new type of job because it involves additional analytics and additional understanding what's actually going on. Again, how we got there. So we were using uh, topological data analysis, and this is a um, quick pipeline, a very simple approach. Uh, well, approach is complex, and it's a very simple example how to, uh, we did this. So again, we start with um, a point in original space. So a uh, point in original space um, can be presented as uh, simplexes. So basically, original space would be um, if we're talking about words, that would be a number of keywords. So if you are dealing with, like, for instance, 20,000 of keywords, the original um, uh, dimensionality of your data would be 20,000 columns, and the rows would be a number of uh, data points you have. So for instance, 360,000. Uh, so the one point would be simplex, and either two points relatively close to each other, you can put a link between them, which would be a one-dimensional simplex, because point is zero-dimensional simplex. So now you put uh, two points together, and you can go further. So if there are three points together and close to each other, you can make it three-dimensional, uh, two-dimensional simplex, sorry. Um, and you can go further, so the next structure would be tetrahedron. So having all this complex structure in your large space, gives you this interesting, um, interesting structure, which is very complex, but it's very difficult for you to understand because it's uh, 20,000 dimensions. So the next, um, we're using um, iterative process as a gradient descent algorithm to present uh, this complex structure on two-dimensional plane um, uh, using uh, and trying to minimize the loss of the original structure and uh, presented structure on two-dimensional plane. So after all these iterations, so about uh, 10,000 of iterations, we get the result. Um, let me uh, give you some uh, more case studies. So this is um, sensor signals. And again, more or less legacy approach, uh, how uh, people do analyze now. Again, IoT is basically is um, uh, time series. So there are a lot of time series from different uh, types of data, but again, this is just value and a particular mo moment of time with a particular frequency. So a lot of people do analysis uh, using either visual approach, as a lot of people do in the uh, stock market, or you're using econometrics. There are a lot of areas in econometrics, how to analyze a lot of time series correlations, uh, self-correlations, and so on and so forth. But again, if you have just one time series, it's fine. But in nowadays, in our world, usually sensors and systems do generate a lot of really complex data. And this data, maybe not just one time series, it might be like a number of time series which you should uh, join together and analyze together. Uh, to put a uh, perspective in what I'm talking about is this example which, yeah, ah, the guy moves. So this is our uh, work with the University of Barcelona. So the guy has a mobile phone on his waist, uh, which is tracking uh, three uh, sensors. You can see them on the left. So the guy do different actions and the sensor capturing um, a gyroscope, compass, and, uh, well, and the, another one. Um, so the guy do different activities, is standing, sitting, laying, walking, walking upstairs, downstairs, walking straight. And in addition, uh, we're also capturing the all intermediate states. So from sitting to walk, from walking to stand, and, um, um, and basically all between. And I can see that well, while, while, while the guy is moving, the sensor readings are different changing. So um, despite it's just three sensors, 
and for many other cases, for instance, in, in case of devices, uh, uh, like for instance, large boilers, you can have not just three sensors, but like, th uh, like maybe do dozens of sensors. You can start on identifying what is it about. So here, we haven't just used this one guy. It was about 100 different people doing different 100 types of uh, activity, oh, so, sorry, the, uh, types of activities like these ones. So, and this is uh, actual animation from the system, how the system works to analyze this data. So what we did, we chunked uh, every time series in the one second uh, part and uh, just thrown it in the data because the data uh, so system, uh, so thrown it in the system because system is actually is unsupervised machine learning system. And that's uh, how the UI looks like. It's a little bit bright, but now uh, the over overlay uh, part uh, will, will be switched on. So there are actually three main clusters. And the main cluster have these points. So the red point means there is a lot of types of activities here. And here, the intermediate cluster has very interesting patterns. So all the transitions all the transition states were captured right in this intermediate cluster. Um, yeah, there should be some more. Yeah. Oh, well. Uh, hmm. Well, that should be, it's actually just half of the video because um, there should be, let me. Let me try to do more. Well, let's see how it will do this time. So you, have, you, you see these three clusters and the cluster in the center. So cluster in the center, that's the most interesting part. So this is the all transition states. So all the transition states for the guy who was moving from sitting to standing and all the in between were in the, in the middle just because these transition states do consist of all the parts of events from all these three other clusters. But uh, as you remember, there are events like walking, standing, seating. Uh, it's surprisingly that system actually analyzed all these different events and generated four main clusters. Well, let's see, will it go further than that point uh, what we had before? Well, no. Uh, anyway, that's probably a tech glitch. So um, this intermediate cluster is a transition. So this one is um, uh, walking, walking upstairs and walking downstairs. That one is uh, lay, laying and seating. And the upper one is um, uh, did we have else? Uh, um, yes, yeah, standing and sitting and laying and, and, um, and so standing, sitting and laying. So that st staying and sitting and that is laying. That will probably won't do the third time. So if you, for instance, didn't know what kind of data we have, so if we didn't know the guy uh, and actually events what the guy did there, we would instantly find that there is three different types of activities, seating, walking, um, and uh, staying. And we will be able to identify the type of sensors and type of readings we are actually getting. Uh, while as we do have, if we actually would have video further, that would be even more interesting because for instance, here in the middle, and now I'll need to show it, so this is just people walking. These ones, people are walking upstairs. So this is a separate cluster, people walking upstairs. And this is a, more, a separate cluster, people walking downstairs. And if you would uh, see carefully, there is a separate cluster of people walking upstairs, which is really, really close to those ones who are going down, walking downstairs. And that was a very interesting case. Why? 
that type of re sensor readings uh, from accelerometer and others actually very close to those who going uh, downstairs despite the guys actually, sorry, walking upstairs despite they actually were downstairs. And the reason was that I mentioned there are different types of people were in the part of the trial and these were actually were older ones. So in comparison to younger people, older would go downstairs having the relatively the same uh, type of sense of readings like younger people going upstairs. So it's probably more difficult or something. Uh, so that's, uh, I don't remember the, uh, actually the uh, ages, but that's very interesting finding that just from readings you can find a lot of uh, for about the person. And that's actually what Apple do uh, currently. Um, you probably know the health app and all this stuff. Um, so the next uh, case study is customer activities. Again, most of the uh, people do analyze uh, customer activity, you, uh, visitors on your website, on any other way, any other system is like using something like Google Analytics. So you plot uh, the graph, you slice and dice the data based on different age, uh, ages, um, geographics, and other types of activity. Um, but in this case, you actually need to explicitly express your request, what kind of data you want to get from it, what, um, uh, what the hypothesis you have. But what if you don't have to ask uh, for the data? What if you need to system to actually, uh, the tool to provide you the interesting insight before you asked uh, for it? So here, uh, we were using um, generative uh, neural networks, uh, which uh, helps you to unify uh, the data set and allow you to uh, get a uh, univariant uh, presentation of the original data set. Uh, I will give an example uh, a bit later how it works, but uh, the algorithm is relatively straightforward with generative nets. Uh, so when you have a uh, Gaussian unit which generates random number. You have one network which generates some uh, embedding space uh, data and you have another network uh, which basically um, takes the result and verify it with original data. So uh, there are two du <coughs> dueling networks uh, which uh, what the generator eventually learns to generate uh, the original data really, really well and um, uh, uh, verifier network, we would say, uh, would be able to verify it ideally and make sure that generated data is very close to the original. So by doing this, you are uh, training a very good presentation, internal presentation, uh, which is called embedding of the original data you can use later. Um, so this is a very good uh, and interesting use case of a dating social network data. So every point here is the user and the position based on uh, customer activity. So what do we have here? So the point color means how um, well uh, the user were retained, and that's the feature called good user. So the good user of the red ones means that users uh, were really retained. Here we switch to deleted users, and these are users who deleted themselves into the period of trial. So for instance, this is a separate interesting cluster. If we select this cluster of deleted users, which is very um, nicely looking, we can click and try, uh, ask our, our system to identify why these users actually were deleted themselves. And the main parameter for the system identifier would be p vote no total zero. Well, it's a bit cryptic. So what it means, p means passive, Vote means number of votes for these people. So no, no votes on total uh, day zero. So basically on dating website, these guys and girls received a lot of negative votes, which actually uh, explain their future life on the system because they were automatically were downgraded way, way lower. So no, no many people would see them in their, their swipe thing and uh, they will see not much response, so they probably will delete themselves pretty soon. And that's the cluster was exactly about. So, despite <clears throat> we found actually some patterns, and we found that this uh, central pa pattern has a lot of uh, active, well-retained users, 
they're still pretty much dispersed all over the place. And here, what we can do, we can use that uh, generative network, try to separate our good users, users with a higher retention from the rest. So basically extract this cluster from the main set. So we would use, uh, again, that uh, GAN uh, technology for this. And this is how we set up in uh, our tool. We'll put some, some title here, put some parameters, uh, provide some hidden layers, and we'll start rendering. Um, yeah. And in result, we will see the map which presents absolutely the same users, but in different way. No? Oh, yes, we have seems technical issues with her. Well, yeah, that was an interesting one. Um, yeah, that's actually the first time I'm presenting, not from my notebook. Um, anyway, uh, yeah. Um, so, in result, we will find, and now I need to explain it, so basically, we will find pretty much three separate clusters where one cluster would be um, all these very high retained users put as a separate very dense cluster, and there will be two more uh, clusters and some, some of the, some others on the rest are all around. But these three clusters are really the uh, that's something we're looking for. These are uh, things you would call personas in, um, uh, in the retail or you would, uh, or the same way in um, uh, apps. So the personas are type of unique activities which uh, you can describe by a number of different parameters. So for every point here on the map, we have something about a bit less than 1,000 of different parameters of their activities over a period of time. So by segmenting it and separating it into different clusters, we're actually extracting and we uh, can find very unique uh, pattern of activity. So the, the best one would be the users who are actually attractive guys who have a girls and have very nice profile and they're active and they generate a lot of activities around themselves. Another cluster would be um, the dedicated users. And remember, that's a dating website. So dedicated uh, boys and girls who came to the service with a particular aim to do the particular stuff. And they're really sticky because they, uh, um, uh, well, because they verify and check everything uh, basically every day. And the other cluster is curious users, those who do, um, just come from time to time um, and less uh, engaged, but they're still way better than the rest. Um, so that's uh, pretty much it. Um, if you want to check the theory of this uh, stuff, go uh, feel free to check uh, these white papers. And yeah, that's pretty much it. Thank you. Um, yeah, have yeah, I have some time for questions. Yeah, here's a question. Hi, thank you very much. Uh, I was curious about the mobile sensor you demoed, and I want to know what's the, uh, like, uh, the, the, like how many people you're testing the algorithm, and you demo three patterns like lie, uh, you know, to sit up, sit up, uh, stand up, to sit down, mm -hmm. and how many patterns you tested? How many uh, people are yeah. in? A, so it's about 100, 100 different people were as a part of that trial, mm -hmm. and uh, for ev for each of them there was about 10, 15 minutes of different types of activities. Mm -hmm. So again, walking upstairs, downstairs. Yeah, did you tell them like what to do, or they can do whatever they, they like, and no, no, then they, you, you they find were, the pattern? They had a list of the particular activities they need to do. Sit, stand, walk. So that's uh, the data set. That's actually public data sets of the published data. That's a public data set how you can, uh, for the 
uh, you, um, academia to write an algorithms to identify activities from just uh, sensor readings. Because again, um, I mentioned about uh, Apple Health. So Apple Health monitoring every iPhone all the time and um, just collecting all this information uh, they can derive much more than just these activities. They probably can under understand like hundreds of different activities people are doing right now in this particular second. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah, there's another question. Do you think it will be a reality in some time that we would be able to control prison pep? prison population by having those uh, motion <laughs> sensors under the skin and see what they're doing? Well, under the skin, that's a scary stuff. But you can put just uh, on, the, on the waist or something. Well, first of all, you, can, you have um, a very precise positioning now, uh, even inside the doors, in, in, indoors positioning. So you can uh, try... What if you want to prevent suicide? You want to know uh, like, what activities they're doing? Oh, well, this one, um, I guess so, I guess so. Um, the legal part is uh, another question here, but if you can trace um, blood pressure and a lot of other parameters, you definitely can infer a lot uh, of the person and every particular uh, minute. Yeah. Uh, actually, Actually, uh, I do have some more slides. Yeah, uh, because just, we have a lot of time. Okay. Uh, we started 15 minutes before. I was just wondering, uh, with this uh, data refiner tool, mm -hmm. um, what, what are the plans with that? Are you planning to sell it, make it available? Uh, yeah, you can check the website. So, um, and if you're interested to try your data, um, we'll be very glad to try uh, data uh, using it. Uh, it's actually, yeah, I have a couple of other examples. Well, because we have 15 minutes more, um, is there's actually a gym customer activity pattern. Uh, and that's a very in uh, interesting example. So these lines of points uh, showing the example where people, what people are actually doing inside the uh, gym facility. And these points mean that there are actually very limited number of features you can uh, derive from this data. So. Basically, people are not really going to the gym facility despite their buying membership there. And all these clusters not related to these uh, lines are actually something unique patterns. So there might be some of the heavy lifters who do some heavy lifting, some other parts uh, which describes the different types of activities. Obamacare health insurance. Uh, so that's uh, one of the projects um, I also did. Uh, that was the uh, aim to identify um, types of, to identify people who rejected the particular insurance um, in the US. So, uh, we were be able to identify the part, uh, some health cases where insurers do reject. And the uh, last one, that's a uh, very well known 20 news groups da uh, text data set. So that's 20,000 documents about 20 uh, different topics. Uh, segmented automatically, unsupervised, in absolutely ideal way. And that's, um, it's actually very interesting on very low level because the color means that it's a type and they're very close to each other. So it's real, really real cool in all 20 separate groups. That's also very interesting, but there's also very high level structure here. And as you can see on the top, there is Christian, religion, and atheism are very close to each other and there are three of them. The next one is politics guns, politics misc, and politics mid-east. They're also very close to each other because that same stuff happens there. But there are many interesting findings, like for instance, medicine, the red ones, very close to the hockey. Uh, <laughs> and the hockey very apparently very close to the baseball. Um, and the for sale, for sale is the group where you sell uh, stuff and which surrounded by the four most uh, often stuff which you sell uh, on the internet, which would be authors, electronics, and hard PC and Mac hardware. Um, so yeah, that's the final part of the talk. So if you have any more questions, no more. Yeah, here's the question.
Um, on your website, you compare your um, platform to other techniques, such as principal component analysis. But I was wondering how this kind of um, technique fares against something like stochastic neighbor embedding. So I noticed when I looked at that list, that was the one that was miss seemed to be missing to me. Mm -hmm. Whereas the results that you get from this seem quite similar to the ones that I've seen before. Uh, well, um, uh, SNE is, yes, it's very actually interesting. It's uh, some questions we, I do receive, yes. Um, the difference here is uh, very interesting because, as you know, SNE uh, do optimize on a uh, uh, lower level. So they do optimize on the record per tracker level, building a tree and then uh, iteratively optimize uh, the distances between. While this approach starts vice versa. It starts from the global structure and going down the line. Um, I actually plan to include the SNE example actually to compare because that would be an interesting comparison. Um, in some way, uh, the examples may be not that far from each other, uh, but in some way, if there is a lot of uh, structure, usually, uh, that uh, approach you mentioned will give you something like round uh, set of points where some structure around, but still. Um, uh, TDA tries to extract more meaningful structure and present it in a more meaningful way. But yeah, any, anyway, it's also much more scalable because uh, again, 362,000 uh, items in SNE would probably take quite a bit to analyze. Thank um, you. Anymore? Yeah, then thank you so much. <laughs>